Hall. Yes. Let's do it again. Let's do it. Let's run it back. I can't wait. Elevation nights. It's gonna be amazing. We've been to the East Coast, West Coast. Yep. Now I think we need to come to Austin, Texas. Yes, and Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. How about Minneapolis? Yes, Kansas City, Missouri. Denver, Colorado. St. Louis, Missouri. Fort Wayne, Indiana. Toronto, Ontario. We gotta see you there Let's April do it. 18th, April 18th through April 27th. 27th. <laughs> going to be yeah, amazing. Yeah, we coordinated that. Awesome. <laughs> but make sure you go get your tickets right now. ElevationNights.com. These nights are seriously like the best, the best. Can't explain it. I wouldn't keep doing it if it wasn't you amazing. You can't explain it. You have to experience it. It'll be me, you, yep. Elevation Worship, and you. you. We'll see you at Elevation Nights. ElevationNights.com. Get your tickets today. Let me know if you're going to be there. I want you to welcome our EFAM around the world right now. All over the world. All over the world. I get stuck in that melody all day. Stop it. Stop it. Because I'm ready to preach. Oh, y'all aren't ready to listen, but I'm ready to preach. I. Y'all, y'all be seated. We're going to go right into the word. Can I pick up where I left off last week? Do the new you resist the temptation to go forward into your future on the old template? Do the new you. It's a little series that I'm doing here in the first month of the year, and I'll go as long as God leads me. But I committed to him to at least do it for this first month. Because I think this cultural phrase that we have comes from the pit of hell. Do you. I mean, cool, yeah. Be unique. That's great. However, if the you that you are doing is not the you that God wants to use, you've got to grow. Amen. Oh, this is going to go good. This is going to go good today. This word that God gave me last week, and I do want to start with where I ended last week. Um, go to Ephesians chapter 4. Briefly, as I read you this scripture and then kind of remind you, I don't often like to say this is a review because then it'll make you feel like you're jumping into the middle of a season, and that's not the case, especially if you're here for the first time. How many of you are in church today really needing God to give you some clarity in your life? And then how many of you believe, put it in the chat as well, how many of you believe that that can only come from Jesus? Real clarity. Now, we can figure out other things other ways, but when it comes to spiritual matters, we need Jesus. And that's what Ephesians 4 is saying. All right, In, in this epistle, epistle is not a wife of an apostle. It's a letter. Breaking out all my preacher humor for the first of the year. Look at verse 20, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 20. I love y'all. Y'all were a little slow to say it back. And I love you enough to tell you the truth, and that's what we're going to do today. This message is going to be a grown up adult message, all right? Verse 20 That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. Well, now that messes up my other least favorite cultural saying live your truth. And Paul just said that I need to learn a new truth. And the truth that is new is not the truth that is new at all. It might be new to you, but the truth is in Jesus, not in me. I don't trust my own judgment enough to figure out what truth is. There was a time in my life when I thought there was a tooth fairy that brought me money for my teeth. That's how stupid I was. So I figured there's probably something I'm still that stupid about today that I haven't figured out that is stupid yet. And uh, baby truth doesn't fall out like a baby tooth. So it has to be uprooted. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited. I'm excited. God is good. God is good. God is good. We got to yank it out. But he said, the way of life, look, verse 22, this is, this is really, really important. You were taught with regard to your former way of life, baby truth, to put off your old self, which is being, shout the next word, corrupted. 
corrupted by its deceitful desires to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in righteousness or true righteousness and holiness. And so that's the contrast we focused on last week. Corrupted, verse 22, put it up again, please. Corrupted, and then verse 24, created. And uh, write them both down if you want to. Corrupted and created. And I'm not saying that there are two yous, but I am saying that according to the scriptural revelation here from Paul, as well as my own personal experience, there is a choosing every day of my life and your life about which one of us is going to show up for any given situation. And once you realize the power of that choice, you don't feel so stuck anymore. And that is a wonderful thing. I get sick of myself sometimes, and I begin to believe that this is just the way I am. And then somebody comes along and says, just do you. And I'm like, great. Pass the cheese fries. I went out to Gaston County to watch Graham wrestle yesterday. Those cheese fries look good. And there were two me's, and my taste buds know exactly about those cheese fries. And my waistline knows what my taste buds are trying to make me forget in that moment where this leads if I do it long enough. So I didn't eat the fries. Cheer me on! Yeah, pastor! But sometimes I don't do as good of a job resisting the fear as I did resisting the fries. Sometimes I don't do as good a job about what comes out of my mouth as what goes in. Say what I want to say, do what I want to do, and I'm just doing you, and you do you, and I'll do me, and together we'll get divorced in seven years just doing each other. This is what Paul is talking about to the church at Ephesus and to the church at Ballantyne and to the church at University City and to the church in uh, Nepal and into the church in the UK and into the church of your heart. When he says, you were taught the truth in Jesus. And so the Lord gave me this, and it really touched me, that I need someone to teach me Jesus. He says, you were taught a way of life in Jesus. And I don't know who taught you about Jesus or who taught Jesus to you, but you ought to thank God for them, and you ought to thank them. Whether that's my mom, thank you. Whether that's Pastor Mickey, he will never ask me for an offering for ministry that I won't help him build it. And so even if the church had $20, if he needed five, if he needed 10, I'd have to pray in tongues about it. But I will always support him because he taught me Jesus. And I'm really grateful that he did. And he wasn't the first one. I mean, at the Methodist church where I grew up, there were Sunday school teachers who taught me Jesus. And I appreciate them so much. And you probably can think of somebody right now who taught you Jesus or who brought you to church so that you could learn Jesus. And you ought to thank God for them. And no, this is not a selfishly motivated part of my sermon because I'm the one who teaches the Bible. I'm talking about those personal people who help lead you to Jesus. It's amazing because I need somebody to teach me Jesus because the world is screaming everything else. So to teach me Jesus, a way of life that is outside of this crazy, corrupt, crooked culture, this siloed culture, this panic attack society, this judgmental culture, this cancel culture, this hypocritical culture, this materialistic culture, this jacked up, it might burn down quick, let's hurry up and praise God while we still got a planet culture. I need somebody to teach me Jesus, but I need Jesus to teach me me. Because in all the things that I've learned about him, there's a feeling I get sometimes that I haven't really met me yet, that I haven't quite grown into the me that I've seen glimpses of. I think I can be more free than I am. I think I can be more patient than I am. I think I can be more intentional than I am. I think I can be a little bit less of a control freak. Why did you say yes so loud to that? You know, you know me. 
We must have grown up together. <laughs> Takes one to know one. <laughs> oh man, the control thing is one of those dumb things that you believe that you have. <laughs> you have no control. So really, a control freak is an idiot. And where we're coming at from the scripture, he says, you were taught the truth in Jesus. The truth about what? The rapture? Sure. But nobody knows the day or the hour. That's not something we can figure out. I mean, I can teach you some charts and all that. That'd be awesome. I can teach you about prayer. And I will tell you one thing about prayer real quick as we go, is that prayer is your way to get out of that default mode that you wake up in in the morning, just like you brush your teeth, just like we hope you brush your teeth and we, we admonish you to brush your teeth. Prayer is that way that you get in contact with God. I'm talking about God. So any view of me that doesn't start with God is doomed to get stuck in an infinite loop of stupid. Because the truth is in Jesus. And that's why I don't want you just buying into everything that you hear out there. Live your truth. What if your truth is a loop of doom? What if, what if God, who stands outside of the loop of time and comes from a realm called eternity, knows you in a way that if you knew you like he knew you, you would stop doing self-destructive things. You would stop running to people who are limited, trying to get an ocean out of a thimble-sized personality and thinking something's wrong with you. Help me preach, y'all. There was somebody who wanted your seat today. You got to use it. I love the Lord because he knows me. And last week I was showing you from Ephesians 4:22. I hope this is not too esoteric, but it really helped me that the new you is not something in the future. When we talk about new year, new you, we all roll our eyes collectively. Because new new you and new new year, yeah, they both start with Y, but <laughs> I've done this before. So move on with that, all that stuff. I'm just out here surviving. I'm just doing me. I'm just getting by. And as long as we think of who we can be in Christ as some future event contingent on our human abilities, we will always be limited to our moods, our emotions, and our background. Because I need somebody to teach me Jesus, but I need Jesus to teach me me. Here's why. When I talk about you changing, you think of that in terms of a destination at a later date. God doesn't think that way. Here's what I showed last week that a lot of people reached out to me and said, oh, I love that. So in case you missed it, when I say the new you, I'm not only talking about the you that is going to be for your future, I'm talking about the you that God is already very familiar with. And I take this not from my own mind, but from Jeremiah 1, verse 5. Do y'all know this scripture? This is a top 10 scripture where the Lord says to Jeremiah, I've got a calling for you. I've got an assignment for you. You've never done it before. You don't even see yourself in this way. You don't imagine that you have the capacity to do it. I'm going to put you as a prophet to the nations. And Jeremiah is about to give God some excuses, but watch what God said to Jeremiah before the excuses begin. He said, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Now for you, the new is out here in the future. When I get married, when my kids get out of the house, when we're able to get pregnant, when the economy bounces back, when I get out of this job, when they leave this job and I stay, when, <laughs> when this happens, I will be. It's out there. That's one way to look at it. You can find Plenty of people on Instagram that will preach that to you. That, you know, get on your grind and buy my course, and then the future you will get girls 
The future you will have washboard abs, a superior intellect, and be able to understand Jordan Peterson perfectly. The future you is going to be amazing, and that's what we normally hear, right? It's all this hype that we pass off as hope. It's like, okay, I'm going to do it new this year, and then after three weeks, we can't, but God does it different. Watch this. Jeremiah is insecure. Jeremiah is inexperienced. Jeremiah is surprised. If you're any of those three things, this is for you. Touch somebody say, this is for you. This is for you. Now, 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 God doesn't tell Jeremiah, no, you're going to be something in the future that I'm telling you about right now if you just do it long enough. He says this, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. So take that knew you and put a K on the top of it. Not just the new you that people haven't seen yet, that you haven't even met yet. Not just the you that you imagine when you get a real good church high, a real good church buzz, wears off about 12 minutes after you sit in traffic in a church parking lot. And instead of seeing this as I'm going forward towards something that I'm really not, see it how God says it. Because what's in the future to you is what's familiar to God. Woo! What's in the future? You call it new. Okay, that's who I'm going to be one day when. And God's like, that's who you already are. That's who you always were. That's what I created you to be before sin corrupted what I created. Oh, God. God got this thing started in my life. God set this thing in motion in my life. God is the one who set me in families. God is the one who set me in time. God is the one who set me in a generation. And I didn't get to say it to the staff Wednesday because I forgot, but I wanted to tell you he is also the Lord of your limitations. Just as God is the God of my potential, he is the Lord of my limitations. It is true that we cannot put in what God left out. It is also true that most of us have no clue what God has put in. The new you, the one God talks with, the one that makes you want to sometimes you just kind of go, I want to change some things for the better. And I think I can. I want some relationships that encourage me this year. And I think I, I think I, I think I have the right to ask God for that. Yeah, I want to get around some people this year who don't just describe bones on the valley floor all the time. I want to get around some people this year that speak breath into the bones and know how to call out something that's on the inside of me. That me is. The true you is the new you. Well, that's what we said last week. This week I got a title, and I'm almost done preaching, kind of, maybe. We'll see. Called, um, I didn't get this title. I, I, I got it from the scripture, but I also got it from a cereal box, <laughs> where you may remember this. If you're a child of the 90s, you definitely remember this. If you remember that Jeremy spoke in class today, you definitely remember this. If you remember Zach Morris's phone and Kelly Kapowski's temptation as a young man for you to lust, and she was the first girl that you ever fell in love with, was Kelly Kapowski, you will definitely <laughs> recognize this. I'll start it, you finish it. Silly rabbit. I want to preach for 15 minutes on tricks are for kids. Because there is no shortcut to this. There is no magical worship button you're going to press this morning that's going to take the wind and the waves away in your life this week. That's how immature people think. One of my buddies texted and said, thank you for sharing that immaturity leads to instability, because I needed to hear that. 
because it is in my selfishness and my own desires. That's what Paul uses that phrase in the scripture. He says, deceitful desires. I, I almost called the message that, but I thought it would sound too depressing. Deceitful. Today, I want to talk about deceitful desires. I, I thought, though, we need to talk about these deceitful desires for a moment. Because if the me that God sees is not the me that I'm stuck in right now, then what's happening in the darkness? He describes to the Ephesian church that we are children of the light, but he also says that the darkness keeps the Gentiles from living the ways of God. And when we copy the patterns of the Gentiles, we are forfeiting the promise of God. Do you understand what I'm saying? So every time you're scrolling through stuff, trying to figure out stuff of what other people are doing, you are forfeiting the self that God knows in the spirit and copying a pattern of the flesh that puts you in that doom loop of stupid. <laughs> so now we have to deal with our desires, which are real. A lot of Christian teaching will almost put faith as the opposite of feelings. You know, we don't walk by feelings, we walk by faith. The Bible doesn't say that. It says we walk by faith, not by sight. So we have feelings. Like, even how would you know that there was faith if you felt nothing? That's the stupidest thing in the world. Preach is good. We don't walk by feelings, we walk by faith. But feelings have a place even in faith. You know, how do I know what God wants me to preach? Well, a certain amount of me has to feel. I'm not saying that, that that's solely dependent on. It has to be true. It has to be from God's Word. But there's a lot of stuff in God's Word. How do I know this is what God wants me to preach for now? Well, there's a certain amount of that. I just have to know it on the inside. Because God knows I'm not going to be one of these preachers that just reads whatever is on the headlines of the news and comes in the pulpit and just gives you another dose of the same crap that's already making you nauseous in the pulpit. You don't come here for that, so I'm not going to do that. I'm not up here to do that. And yet, what is the word that God has given us for this moment, for this year? What is the word that God has given your life for this point in time? What is it? How do you know if God's calling you to go here or there? How are you going to know if God's calling you to do this or that? How do you even know what you're good at? I mean, part of this has to be feelings, right? They have their place. But now, here is how the enemy pickpockets you. Here is how the devil gets you to give up, watch this, the new self that God knows, the you that you kind of suspect is there, the you that you can be for about three days at a time, and then you give in. How does he get you to give up on that so easily? Deception. And in order to deceive, you have to diminish. Quick story. I mentioned my mom taught me about Jesus. She also confronted this person one time for me, and I never will forget being nine years old, going to the trading card shop in Monk's Corner at the railroad track, right over the railroad track. I bought a pack of basketball cards. I didn't know anything about basketball cards. This was my first pack of basketball cards. I had baseball cards. And I open it, and there's a Michael Jordan card in the pack. The guy's watching me. I'm in there by myself. She's waiting in the car, and he goes, hey, um, I'll give you a whole other pack for that one card. I'm like, a whole pack for a card? Sure, mister. I called him mister. <laughs> Sound like the Andy Griffith show in here. <laughs> sure, mister. Gee whiz, golly. A whole pack for a single card? Wow, because I'm just a kid. I'm just a kid. So I opened the next pack. I don't recognize any names. I knew Michael Jordan. Went out to the car. My mom said, How'd it go? I said, I got two packs. She said, how'd you get two? I gave you money from one. I said, you never believe it. He gave me a whole other bag for one card, Mom. She said, what was the card? Because she knew this man has a book. He knows how much that card was worth. And he's grown. And my kid doesn't know the value of a card. 
so, 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 so. She said, what was the card? I said, Michael Jordan. She said, a Michael Jordan car? How much was it worth? I said, I don't know what it was worth, but I got a whole pack. My mom went back in that store with my Michael Jordan car and the third pack because she knew what was in the book. Do you have a book? Have you read it? Have you met Jesus? Did you know he's the perfect, spotless Lamb of God? Did you know they marched him up a hill called Calvary and he died for you? And bled for you and suffered for you and took the stripes for you and took the mocking for you and he stretched his arms and said you're worth this much did you know that when he left to go to heaven he sent his spirit and that spirit lives in you. No, we don't know that. We don't know that. We're so busy copying other people's style that we don't even know the spirit that came from God because we got so much stuff from culture. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm Baptist. In my heart, I went to a Baptist school. Comes out sometimes. I'm sick of this. Feel like walking up in the devil's card shop and helping you get your peace back, your joy back, your your dream back, your sweet self back, your created self back. I got the book. I looked you up in the book. I found out that you are precious in the sight of God. I found out that you are more than a conqueror. I looked you up in the book. You don't know me, Pastor. Neither do you. That's why I'm trying to introduce you to Jesus so Jesus can introduce you to you. The new you. New with a K or new with an N? Both. That's what I want you to get this year. And I will preach through every battery they sell in Radio Shack until. You get this. Do they still have Radio Shack? I need to update the reference. <laughs> All right, look, we'll order them on Amazon. It'll be fine. We'll get the batteries. Y'all get distracted by the dumbest stuff. How about that? When you think of the enemy's tricks and God's truth, what comes to your mind in your life? The first step. If we're going to do the new, spell it out. Notice, evaluate, and then the W's are not quite as good, but walk in. Okay? Notice, evaluate, walk in. Psychology for all of you who are too stubborn to go to therapy. You can't deal with feelings until you know they're there. So now, one habit I've incorporated in my life the last five years, instead of going, uh, I'm scared, I try to back up and go, I'm having a feeling of fear. Because if I say, I am scared, that becomes an identity. I'm feeling fear, that's an event. The truth is in Jesus. Jesus isn't scared. Jesus is in me. So I'm feeling fear, but that's the old thing. That's the old thing. So I notice it. I evaluate it. Like how, I mean, you would, you would probably, I would think, spend time shopping for a pair of shoes if you're going to spend money on them. You probably would spend time figuring out do they fit. And we will spend more time evaluating what we put on our feet than what we put in our mind, our heart, who we let in our phone. So is this from God? Is this what God gave me, or is this a trick? Now, 
how you know if it's a trick? Well, you got to have the book value, and then you have to. Well, you have to actually spend time. You have to actually spend time around people who love God. They had a thousand e-group leaders, I think, that online and physical, that they encouraged this week. Let's thank God for our e-group leaders. Amazing. Holly came out and preached. We've just been going this week, man. We've been going. We're getting ready. We're getting ready. I don't even know what it is that God wants to do, but I figure since they're saying the world is going to fall apart, a falling apart world needs a built up church. And I want to be that. I want to be that church ready for them. All over the world. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'm going to do it with whoever God gives me around me to do it. We're going to build something significant for this season of our life in Jesus' name. And then, you know, if you think about when somebody uses a counterfeit uh, ticket, because Elijah shops all the time for these shoes, I'm like, how do you know if they're real or not? If you get it off this side or that side, how is it all verified and all of that? And when, when, when me and my father-in-law and my brother-in-law, Jody, they all go to our Greenville campus. Holly's family is all at Elevation Greenville. They better all be there right now, because it would be embarrassing if they're not. Um, we went to a New York Knicks game, and we, want, we were just spur of the moment wanting to go. This is when I was dating Holly, and her dad, you have to know this guy. He's real. He's kind of like, um, he's a bull in a china shop. So I say, how, how are we going to get tickets? And, and, we, and he said, well, they're too expensive. We'll just buy them off a scalper. Uh, isn't that dangerous? He's like, no, 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 not if you know what you're doing. So we buy these tickets, and we're walking up. And it's kind of dark, and so we're walking up to the game. And I'm like, Merle, these tickets don't look… Are they supposed to be printed diagonal on there? Doesn't Nick's have a C in it somewhere? <laughs> it wasn't that bad, but it looked kind of fake. And we get to the thing. And we hand them to the guy, and he laughs. He doesn't hardly even look. He laughs. And he, and he goes, God, you got ripped off, man. Go do what you got to do at the box office or go back to the hotel. This isn't real. And my father-in-law goes, how do you know? You didn't even hardly look at it, pal. And he goes, he goes um, this is what I do all day. When you've handled as many real ones as I have, I saw the fake ticket in your eyes. You walk like you have a fake ticket, you country bumpkin. This is New York City. Anyway, can I be myself in the pulpit? Sometimes it feels good. Do you, Pastor? I promise I'll do the holy, the good one, the, the anointed one. I won't do the other one. But. Now we decide what to walk in. And so when he says deceitful desires, when Paul says deceitful desires, the key is for you to be handling the real thing enough that your feelings begin to align with your faith. And when they don't, you notice it and you bring it back. Feelings have their place. Feelings have their place. How many of you agree with me? Feelings have their place, but it's not on the throne. Jesus sits there. The book sits there. The Spirit of God is the seat of my decisions, not what I feel. Because if I do, I'll end up with a pack of crap and trade the goat. So if the enemy is diminishing it, he's deceiving you. Well, you're not that gifted. And I, I, I think it comes in this way. Like, well, you don't really matter that much. This doesn't really matter that much. I mean, there's one time you <laughs> who cares? That's how deceitful desires work. The desire isn't bad. The way the enemy tries to get you to fulfill it is. That's what a deceitful desire is. Whether it's a sexual desire, whether it's a financial desire, whether it's a desire for success, you can't attack the desire and demonize the desire. 
The first question Jesus asked in the New Testament was, what do you want? So apparently desires are not something to be bypassed in our life. The deceit is not in the desire. The deceit is what the enemy tries to get you to do to get the desire. That's where the deceit is. Oh no, you just settle for that. You just scavenge for that. All you're ever going to be is that. All you're ever going to get is that. All you really can do is that. All you ever have done is that. All you ever have been is that. You're trash. That's why they walked out. You're trash. That's why it hasn't happened yet. You're stupid. That's why you haven't built it yet. You're an idiot. That's why all your friends make that. You make this. You suck. But if you are growing in Christ, the more you grow in him, you get the ability from the inside to notice it, evaluate it, and look him right in his eyes and say, silly devil. Tricks. You should have you should have tried this on me before I got back to church this year. Because I'm growing this year. Tricks are for kids. But I am a new creation in Christ. I got the book. Silly devil. That's for kids. That's kids. That's child's play. That's how I thought when I didn't know God. That's how I spoke when I didn't know God. That's how I came running when I didn't have a liberator named Jesus. That's how I struggled in my sin before I had his name to call on. I got help now. I got a new self and a new self. And the me that God saw in eternity is the me that I see in the future. And I'm moving into it. And I'm growing into it. And I'm going to be it because I am it. Yes, Lord. Touch somebody say, silly rabbit. Trying to eat kids' food. Trying to do kids' stuff. Trying to get people to notice you. What are you, fifth grade? Saying, I can't change. What is this, seventh grade? Somebody wrote in your notebook, never change, and you took their advice and raised hell over the summer, and here you are still are, pitching a fit over what you didn't get when God has given you the riches of Christ and the Spirit of God and the fire that came down on the day of Pentecost is burning in your belly. I'm growing now. I'm growing out of this. Saw somebody say, I'm growing out of this. I'm growing out of this. I'm growing out of this. This addiction will not be able to hold me another 10 years. I'm growing out of this. It might take me some time. It might take me some tears. It might take me some tough decisions, but I'm growing out of this. I will not stay in this prison. Not one more day. I'm coming forward. Somebody should have told Esau, the stew is not that good. Do y'all know about Jacob and Esau? You do? You know about Jacob? The God of Jacob? It wasn't supposed to be the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It was supposed to be the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. He was the oldest brother. He had the right to the inheritance, just like you have an inheritance in Christ. What is it? Every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, reconciliation with God, the ability to be at peace with him and others, the love of God shed abroad in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. You have that. So why do we not sing, I'm calling on the God of Esau? Apart from the fact that it doesn't rhyme with generations, which is the next line in that song. Why?
because he got hungry. Because he saw a bowl of, was it cereal or stew? Stew. Stew. Jacob was cooking stew. And it's interesting because all the way from Rebecca's womb, they've been wrestling each other. Jacob's name means deceiver, trickster. Exactly. Exactly. And the funniest book in the Bible, if you know how to look for it. And if the Bible is boring to you, you're boring. The Bible's not. God is interesting. You're basic. Because. It's the funniest book. What is the one I gave you in Genesis 25 where it said about the nations wrestling in her womb? The, the Lord said the nations are wrestling in your womb. Two nations, two natures, two you, two yous wrestling in the womb of what God is doing in your life. The old one that was put on that is being corrupted, the new one that's the real one that was created in the image of God that he sent his son to bring you back to. And he said, two nations are in you, two peoples. One will be stronger than the other. The other will, older will serve the younger. Give me some more. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. Right now, there are twins in the womb of your mind, your heart, your desires. I'm not preaching this in an allegorical way. It said it in Ephesians. I'm illustrating it. I'm illustrating it to you. That's exactly what Paul said. And I want you to notice this might be the best part of my sermon, and I saved it too late, so you probably won't even hear it. But it didn't say, make sure you don't take off the new nature and put the old one back on. The old one was the first one that is mentioned, which means that your natural state of mind is not your true nature. In order to put on what God gave you, you have to take off what he didn't and stop accepting any old attitude as being you because that's not you. Oh, I notice it. There I am again blaming people. I notice it. There I am again catastrophizing. I notice it. There I am again, but I'm not it. I notice it, but I'm not it. Because I have learned the truth in Jesus and a new way of life. So I'm taking that off and putting this on. I'm taking, I'm growing out of that old one and I'm growing into my new one. The future me is God's familiar me. That's what I'm becoming. And since my life had its origins in the mind and heart of God, nothing can stop it. Just ask the stone what can stop God? Therefore, when we look at Jacob and Esau, we see a picture of us. We see that they were wrestling from the womb, and I told you I'd give you the funny verse, and I didn't yet. Give me next verse. The first one to come out was Rez's whole body is like a hairy garment, so they named him Esau. That's not the funny one. It sounds funny. He's a hairy. They named him Esau, which means red, because he was red. Real creative, Isaac. After this, brother came out with his hand grabbing Esau's heel. That's Jacob grabbing Esau's heel. That's been you a lot of your life, too. That's been you trying to, by, feel, by I want to be first. I need to be that. Oh, no, I need to be that. Now, watch what happens. He was named Jacob, trickster. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebecca gave birth to them. The boys grew up. That's the funny verse. Because they didn't. Physically, they did. Esau became a skillful hunter, and you've accomplished a lot too. No, 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 you have. I'm not saying that sarcastically. You've learned a lot, you've become a lot, you've overcome a lot, and I want to pause and celebrate your progress to this point. I'm not setting you up. You got that hesitant clap like, is he about to tell us what we're really filthy rags? Not. But I'm saying it's possible for you to grow in your skillfulness and be deficient in your spirit. So, so Esau, he's a good hunter. He's growing up. 
They're both grown up, but they're doing the same crap they did when they were little boys. They're still fighting, and Jacob is still tricking, and Esau is still stupid. I mean, he's good at hunting, man of the open country. Jacob's content to stay home among the tents. Isaac had a taste for wild game, but loved Esau. Rebecca loved Jacob. Now watch this. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, I, I, I think it's no coincidence that stew is the beginning of stupid. Because this is worse than a pack of cards. This is worse than any house you ever bought. This is the worst deal in human history. Jacob is cooking some stew. Esau came in from the open country famished. Now, the first thing Esau needs to do is notice, I'm hungry right now. I am in no position to make decisions right now. I am in no position to respond to this email right now. I am in no position to have this conversation right now. I'm hungry. I need a minute. Even if I have to fake like I'm going to the bathroom, that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to stand in the bathroom and call on the God of the bathroom, and he'll meet me in the bathroom. He's the God of the mountain. He's the God of the bathroom, too. I'm going to shut this stall and pray before I sell my soul for some stew. She's not that pretty. She's not that gorgeous. Not to throw away what God gave me. I need a moment to notice I'm hungry right now. Trying to make this real where it can live where you live. Praise God. He said, he said I'm famished, and then watch what he did because he did not notice it. Because he did not notice it, he responded to it, and he responded to his hunger now in a way that he would hate later. And I've done it many times. Quick, he said to Jacob, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. I'm famished. I'm famished. I'm not I'm feeling hunger right now, but let me deal with it the right way. I am what I feel. Are y'all getting as much out of this as I am? This is a good sermon stew right here. Look at me. Look at me, church. Give me the verse again. I'm famished. I'm exhausted. That's why he was called Edom Red. Verse 31. Jacob replied, first some of your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, Swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. And that's why we're calling on the God of Jacob for a single meal. Next verse and final. So Esau despised his birthright for some bread. And lentil stew. He ate, drank, got up, left, and despised his birthright. I thought that's strong language. It doesn't say he hated his birthright. But when you are hungry, when you are hungry, you will make decisions now that will create a life that you hate later. This year, God brought you to Elevation Church and our EFAM online to tell you it's not too late for you to change. If you're still breathing, you've still got a birthright. If the blood is still running warm in your veins, you have a birthright. And the blood that Jesus shed for you purchased it back from the devil. So we've got the book, and we've got the blood, and we have an opportunity this year, this moment. Forget about it. This very moment, you have the opportunity to make an exchange. Your unrighteousness for his righteousness. Your sin for his salvation. Your no for his yes. Your filthiness for his purity. You don't see it. Your ashes for his beauty. 
This is the greatest exchange that has ever been made. Not with Jacob. I'm talking about Jesus. The great exchange of love and grace. You don't get it through grinding. Tricks are for kids. You don't get it through effort. That's for the perfect people. But for the children of God. There is a grace for this moment, a grace to change you, a grace to call you forward. It's pulling on you now. That's why you feel it. It's not me speaking, it's him speaking. I'm teaching you Jesus, and Jesus is showing you you. How many times are you going to give the enemy your desires and let him tell you how to fulfill them? the new you. I'm walking in a new way. Oh, it's going to be step by step, baby. What, you thought I could just put this new attitude on you like it's my jacket? I would if I could. I could sell this jacket for a lot of money if it worked like that. No, no, no. This wardrobe is only received through your daily walk and worship. So. I keep hearing the Lord say it. It's an old line, but I just got to say it. Beans for a birthright? Beans for a birthright? Uh uh. You're making trades every day. Stupid trades. Y'all laugh at Esau. Me and Esau have a lot in common. I've given up a lot of stuff too because I felt it. I defied my feelings this week. Everything in me told me you don't have enough songs to record this Friday. But something in me said, put it on the calendar and let God give you the songs that He wants you to have and do what He told you to do. I got a question. Answer me in the chat. Do y'all think God knew about those songs before I did? You think God knew about the season you're in before you did? Do you think that he knew that you were going to need a job before you did? Do you think he knew that we would be in a time of political, how we say this, weirdness before we did? Right. Before we were born, he knew what we were born into. What I love about the Lord is that there are no tricks with him. Only a trade. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's sorrow. This is the trade. No one moving. In just a moment, our pastors are going to give an invitation for people to receive Christ. Be ready. I just want to tell you this before I give the service to them. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come? To the end of yourself, do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Thank you for watching the Elevation Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the EFAM, our online extended family, and join us live every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream, and share this with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give Now button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. God bless you.